Craig, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad I get to talk to you. Um, I, I want to start just from the beginning, man. I want to start from you were you're from Mississippi, from Hattiesburg. Yeah. Yep. What was it like growing up? What were you listening to? What kind of music were you into? Man, you know, I really I look back now and really appreciate it because Hattiesburg is uh, about 60 miles up from the coast, about 100 miles. From, if you go to New Orleans from here, you 59, you go through Hattiesburg on the way to New Orleans. So I could get all those radio stations and then the coast. And so, man, I listened to everything. And we have one of those classic, you ever hear this, uh, you ever hear uh, Rex Bob Lowenstein, one of those songs? Um, we have one of those classic AM stations, too, WFOR, oh, yeah. that would play Frank Sinatra and then George Jones. And then, and then you know, it was one of those, they played everything yeah. before all that stuff before happened. Before formats and all yeah, that Yeah, exactly. Stuff. They would just they'd play whatever. So, I mean, I listened to everything and liked everything. You know, my mom even, my mom was like, man, you know, your Disney storybook albums when you were a kid, I put those on for your nap time and mm. stuff. And so, you know, just music was just, you know. I don't know so really... when did you decide you were going to be a songwriter? Was it just something that you knew that you were good at or were you a poet? Would you? No, no, I mean, I loved it. So I, 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 I was playing drums. I started playing drums and in bars and stuff, and all this happened. Well, I was playing, I wanted to play drums because, like, in seventh grade, the high school jazz band, you know, and I was like, oh, I want to play drum set in that. And then out of that, um, so jamming with your buddies, right, but drums are loud, so you invariably, there'll be the time when the drums have to shut down, so everybody just have a guitar, so my buddies taught me some chords. And I still say that one of the best songs to ever learn to learn guitar is Freebird because it has like every <laughs> every chord in it. It really yeah, is just like yeah. E minor A, A minor F, C, G. Yeah. It's just the whole thing. And um, somewhere along the line, so I know what happened. I, I think there was an REO Speedwagon or something song, and there was a song that I learned, just three chord, you know, stupid rock song, that I wrote my own lyrics to, changed the lyrics to. And I only did that one time. So it was already a song, but you changed the lyrics. Yeah, and made yeah it your which, own. Which, which I hear from reading about other songwriters. I hear there's a lot of guys that used really? that did that for a lot. That was kind of their template yeah. to start with. I did it one time, but you know what happened, man? I was a church camp kid, right? <laughs> and I'm a horrible guitar player. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I couldn't. Still, I mean, the, still? The idea, oh, horrible. Oh, ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh, man. I mean, there's friends of mine when I'm playing guitar, they're just like. <laughs> <laughs> just stop, <laughs> Craig, please. Yeah, it's, like, well, you know, yeah, yeah, it's like watching their grandfather <laughs> drive. They're like, oh, man, man, no, 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 no. Yeah. So, 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 but, man, I went to church camp, right? And I had my course because I was going to do it so I, can, you know, so, I, right, so I could walk some girls home, you know, and get course. a kiss and stuff. That's why we all but, learn but, guitar. But here's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But here's what I figured out, man. So right when you're trying to learn how to, because think about it. Think about learning music, back then especially. Like, So you have, like, Stairway to Heaven. There's one of the best guitar players on planet Earth. Yeah. And you are one of the worst guitar <laughs> players on planet Earth trying to imitate him exactly. I mean, think about that. Yeah. I mean, you know. So, so nonetheless, I was going to but I went to church camp, and you figure I'd just sing a church camp songs, you know, Amazing Grace or Michael Rutherford or Shore or whatever. You, f you figure out, like, well, not just G, every, kind of the people's key of G, yeah. not, you know, not too, not too low for the girls, not too high for the guys. And I figured out from that, it's like, well, man, well, you know, all these songs are just the same three or four chords. Like, you could just play over and over. And I realized, like, I went home and told my brother that. I was like, you can play all these church camp songs. And then, it, he, so he was a huge country nut, so he, I saw he, so he had a G and he started singing and, I was like, you can play all these country songs. And then I realized, I, I think I played the Joker, Steve Miller. Oh, Some yeah. people call me the Space Cowboy. <laughs> yeah. And I was like. The chicks love that one. And I was yeah. like, oh, my God, all these songs, all of these songs. And what it is, I learned, I learned this amazing thing called transposing, which means changing the key. So instead of me trying to, so ill-equipped and horrible, trying to come to the music, I brought the music to me. Yeah. And from that, I mean, from that, that's when I started writing songs. Like I said, so I wrote that one song and then just started. I would stay up that one summer I was 15. I would stay up till sunrise writing horrible, horrible songs, but writing five or six a night just wow. with my chords and just my, my little desktop recorder. And just, uh, and there was no, like, well, I'm going to be a big songwriter or anything. I just loved, loved 
And I always kind of was, not, you know, the, the Phil Collins, Don Henley's of the Eagles and stuff like that, just sort of cut off the drummer, too. Yeah. So, But just the songwriters, you kind of realize, like, every group, there's a songwriter in there. There's a guy who's really kind of writing it. And just loved that. Just loved, and I still do. So did you find out that there was actually a way to make money writing songs, or how did you move, no. make the move to Nashville? So I was in a band. I was in a road band that, that, that was getting me pretty popular, and we had a there was a there was a guy that financed us some, and me and the me and the lead singer from this band, he wanted to get us under contract. You guys were that good that and you had he, a, someone to finance you. Well, 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 well you know, pay for the PA and stuff yeah, like that. I mean, yeah. this, this is all this is all just you know basic stuff. Um, but the lead singer, he wanted, he wanted, you know, the, the band Alabama had broken. That kind of went through everything. Like, almost, look at this, you know, because Alabama was huge. They yeah. sold 80 million records. I mean, you know, it was serious. So bands, all of a sudden, were getting some focus. And he wanted to give me a contract. And and he gave me a contract because I was writing some stuff for the band. And thank God my mom was attending Peabody at the time from Hattiesburg. She would come up. She was always in academia, working on her Ph.D. in, like, in, you know, education administration or whatever. And I actually had, we had two weekend gigs, so I had the week open, and I was like, I want to ride with you to Nashville. And she went to Peabody, which is right there off of 18th, and I literally walked to Music Road from there. What was it like then? Was booming? Like, I mean, it was not not a bunch of high-rises like it is now. No, right? no, it was all just houses, and it was all, I mean, that's just it. Everybody says, everybody's trying to save Music Road. It's like, man, uh, back then, there was nothing but little houses yeah. with people, you know, at, that's, that's just people up in attics writing songs. It was all. It was the old Chris Christopherson days. Sure. Really, you could come to town, the Chris Christopherson thing, you could come to town, sweep floor in a studio, do a thing, uh, finally get offered a deal, go down the street to your lawyer who got you a deal, who took you down further down all the street right there. to get your manager, who took you further down the street <laughs> to the record label. Yeah who got you that, and then you started making money, and somewhere on that street you bought a house, and that was your publishing yeah. company. And all of that happens just right there in this little two-mile little That's right. racetrack. That's right. You know, and it still does. That's why I'm there. I mean, when I bought my first building on Music Row, I, I was I was tear, I was tearful. Yeah, I really we'll, was. We'll I was, get there because that's pretty cool that it comes full circle like that. You So Mom was at Peabody, yep. and, and what did you do? You you went on over to P- Music Row? I, and- I, I, I took my contract, and you know what it is? Um Ken Levitan, who, who's a manager now, he was a lawyer then. I remember walking, saw the sign, Levitan, music attorney. I was like, that's what I need. I'm literally <laughs> ignorant, does not begin to describe. Yeah. And I literally walked in, and I go to the girl, and I'm like, I need somebody to look at this contract. She was like, oh, I'm sorry, you have to get in the point. I was like, no, I just, can I just pay somebody $20 look at this contract because I don't even know what's going on. And one, and one of Ken's Levitan, and this guy, I think he was Mike, Anyway, there was a lawyer over there with a jacket off, just in his Oxford white shirt, you know, sleeves rolled up like at the copy machine. And finally, he just goes, Mary, Mary, I, I got this guy. Come here, come here. So I follow him back to an office. He doesn't with even your sit 20 out. bucks. He, yeah, he, doesn't, he doesn't even sit down. He's just like, well, who are you? What's going on? I'm like, Craig, I'm in a band. This guy's in a contract. <laughs> and just like, and he's looking through there, and he's just like, you're not even getting a draw. I'm like, what's a draw? <laughs> what are you talking about, and man? He, said, he, 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 he he goes, this guy's getting all your publishing. And I was like, what's publishing? I mean, just seriously. Yeah. And finally, he just throws it on the desk and goes, tell you what, I'll give you 20 bucks not to sign that. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And he goes, man, if you write songs, he goes, just come to town. He goes, we'll shop you around. We'll get you a deal. And I was like, uh, and I, 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 thought he, I, I thought he meant like record deal. I was like, oh, he goes, no, at a publishing company. You can just be a songwriter. And I was like. Wait a minute, I could just be a songwriter? He goes, yeah, man. He just started rattling off. Like, at the time, he said, like, you know, Russell, he goes, people that were in bands, like Russell Smith, he was in the Imagine Rhythm. Now he's a songwriter and just listed all these people. And I was like, I could just come write songs. He was like, yeah. And I was like, whoa. So I went back to my band. I told him, I was like, whatever our last gig we have booked, whatever it is, three months out from now, like, that's it. I'm going to give you that much time to find another drummer. I'm, I'm moving to Nashville. I'll write songs. I'm gonna go be a songwriter. Now, did you, you know? did you move and crush it right away? God no, no. It was '85. No, no. I mean, I got here and uh, I, was, I was still a musician. I played six nights a week, so I went to Trinity Lane, which. <laughs> 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 hey, if you know, you know. You know? Was a, but it was it was the place where the musicians hung out. A place called Real Country. You talking R- East Nashville? R E E L. Yeah, right there at yeah. 65 Trinity Lane. And, and yeah, and, and, and basically the band would play, and in the last set, they, whoever was hanging out, they could get up and play just to sort of 
It was. We're just like, okay, all you, all you, all you street people, go ahead and go up there, and and did that for a, a couple of weeks. And finally, one guy was like, "Craig, man, there's there's a band up in Madison, man, looking for a drummer." I told him you're a nice guy. You want to go? So I went up there, and so I went from being a Mississippi making six, seven hundred bucks a week, playing maybe five nights a week. In some places it was like you had to close at midnight, so you played from eight to eleven thirty. I got here and got my first gig seven nights a week, six hours a night, $25 a night. I mean, that's that's just illegal. Dude. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, I, I went home and did the math. I was like, I'm doing more than 40 hours yeah. a week of yeah. playing drums. So, yeah, man. So, yeah. So I wasn't, but it's really good because I was trying to write songs. If I was trying to do something on Music Row, I would just stay up because I would get home at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And, yeah, not to mention it was a $5 trip in gas up there and back. And so, um, and after six months, and somebody else came and hired us for in Hendersonville, a place called the 11th Frame, but it was six nights a week at $35 a night. And so I finally had a night off to go to one of these songwriter bars. And even then, the Bluebird was, was kind of the Bluebird. So Douglas mm-hmm. Corner was the place. So I went to my first night in Douglas Corner, my first night off after six months. <clears throat> I'm in Douglas Corner. I'll never forget Merv. He was just like, somebody said, man, this Craig new town and everything. And he handed me a Rolling Rock beer, and I still love Rolling Rocks. It was like, man, this, you know, this is cool. This is different. Nice green you know, bottle. It's foreign. This, yeah. is, this is fancy. Yeah. <laughs> but there was a guy walking around in a hoodie with a cowboy hat, and I was like, well, man, you've already got your head covered. Why do you need the cowboy hat? I mean, like, that seems a bit overkill. Man. So, um, so he's walking around there, and then these guys get up on stage, and he just goes, man, I just want to thank you guys. As you guys know, I got my record deal and everything at Capitol and everything, but you know, the health and milk crazy. He's like, man, you guys put your cassettes in there. You know, I'm always w- listening for songs and everything. It was Garth Brooks. Wow. And beside him sat, in fact, this was the big, big, I've told this story before. Beside him sat a little guy, and so Garth and these two other guys got up there to kind of do the 930 slot or whatever it is. And Garth sings and somebody else, and then he gets this guy beside him, and this guy was just, he's one of those guys, as soon as he started playing, you were just sort of in his room with him. It was just that enchanting, just this, wow, man, this guy. Is just, I walk slower, trying to make it a lot. I mean, still, I was just like, wow. Like, it's not stuff on the radio, just yeah. stuff, just the best music I ever heard in my life. Just this guy's solo, and it was like, oh, my God. And, and finally, he gets up there and Garth, and then finally he gets up there and he's, his turn again, looking back on the memory of... Was that a single and, yet? Dude, he sung the dance, and Garth was silent. I'm like, well, man, somebody's got to cut that song one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm sitting back. So meanwhile, I'm in the back of Douglas Corner, and I'm just mesmerized. And I looked at my buddy, and I was like, who is that guy? And the guy said, Tony Arata. And I was like, oh, my God, where does he write? And the guy goes, oh, he doesn't have a deal, man. I think he works for, like, some printing company or something. And I'm like, and seriously, I was like, that guy doesn't have a deal? Mm. What in the hell am I? Yeah, you're and screwed. seriously, that night, it was probably the only time ever drove home that night just going, what am I doing, man? Deflated. I could pack, I could pack my crap up, leave at daylight, and be home in time for lunch. And really, it was, it was just like, but at the same time, it was so inspiring. It was just this, wow, man. There's Look, something. Some, somebody just sat down with a with a notebook and a guitar and wrote that holy crap man. yeah yeah there's you know, something to be said about being in a town where there's so much talent there's it's yeah. scary right but it's no. also like you said it's, inspiring it's absolutely it is absolutely it, it it truly is that there is that there is that there is that conflicting there is that 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 thing of just that holy crap man you know it's really i mean as i like to as i tell people now that whole thing, I mean, you know, when people are like, oh, I have to move to Nashville, I have to do this. I mean, it's kind of like this. Like, you've been playing pickup basketball with your brother in your backyard with your hoop against the barn. Sure. You need to go to Chicago and play against Michael Jordan because he's going to kill you. Yeah. I mean, and he's going to kill you for a long time. But at some point, you're going to be able to play against Michael Jordan. That's right. And that's what we're going for. But – that 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 boot camp time of you being broken down and rebuilding and remaking yourself is um that's not for the faint hearted man. It's, so how um, many how many failures 
came before oh. your big break? Your um, first big break. I didn't, I didn't failures. I mean, I don't know. I'm just doing my. Don't even, did, dude, did, don't even, don't even see that's your did problem, you, dude. That's your problem. <laughs> don't even, don't even think about it in terms of failures. Yeah. What, what, what? It's just no. Sorry, um, man. You know, but by then I was just writing all the time. But you know, it was like year three, and uh, you know, funny thing is that bar in Hendersonville. I think Roy Orbison was one of the investors in it or whatever, and his son, Wesley, would come to that bar. We got to be friends. Wesley's a very, very nice guy. And uh, he was just like, man, and he and I would write some songs sometimes. He was like, you know, know, Daddy likes some of our stuff, man. He wants to write stuff for his album. I'd been here about three years at that point, and long enough to be cynical. I was just like, three years, long time. That's never going to happen. It's just like, it's never, like, no. But up there, we wrote some songs and everything, and the next thing you know, he's like, and I come to the car. I mean, Daddy's gonna. I'm gonna play some Daddy. And he had cut. Basically, Roy cut his son's song, but I happened to be the co-writer on it. And you know, so, so wow. And that was a good lesson too. There's some politics there. There's some, you know, it takes all of that. All the, you know, luck meets preparation meets all that. Yeah. Meets desperation and all that stuff. So, but you know, the weird thing was that happened. But I realize now everybody else in the industry saw it, what, saw it for what it was. It was a Wesley song. It wasn't mine. And he was on Virgin. And it wasn't, so it wasn't sure. even in Nashville. It didn't show up on the Nashville radar at all. You know, so. Well, here we are, 29 number ones. Um, do you listen to the radio and sometimes kind of hear a song and forget that you wrote it? You're like, oh, crap. Oh, whoa, whoa, I did write that. It, I, not not when I'm listening to the radio because that's more intentional. But I I will be walking through, you know, a Walmart or something like that, and all of a sudden, and sometimes my wife is just like she'll just and I'll she'll be walking and she'll just tap my arm and I'm just like what I didn't what I didn't I wasn't looking at that girl you know <laughs> <laughs> and then realize like oh oh yeah 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 I wrote that one yeah yeah and that that's what freaks me out the fact that. Because I, I do always kind of feel like the imposter a little bit. And the fact that that's what really gets me. And I do remember when stuff of mine would come on the radio and it would be those, that five beats before I knew. And I realized, like, my stuff mm-hmm. just fit right in with that other stuff, like, almost seamlessly. And, like, that's like, that can't be right. I mean, come on. I mean, how could my stuff be right in, right in there with that? With that stuff, man. I mean, it is. It's still a little, it's a little, wow, man. You know, I think there is a little bit of a, you know, like I said, a little bit of the imposter thing or something. I don't know. What's Uh, the biggest challenge even now? Because you're still writing. I mean, what's the biggest challenge now um, with, you look at bands like the Rolling Stones and, and, you know, bands that just lasted a lot, a lot of years because they changed their music. Yeah. Aerosmith. They changed their music with the time. So they got to last for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Is that the same with you? Or you- yeah, very much so, man. I'm trying to, because it went from when I was when I really started doing it. I, you know, nobody. I was a guy that wrote. I was, it was weird for me because I was a guy that wrote tempo. It was really weird. So I was a guy. I, I, I became the tempo guy in town. People kind of who had no business cutting my stuff. What but, does that mean, the tempo guy? I, everything I wrote. So that was another great thing from the bluebird. What I learned because I want to. I'm a drummer in a band, yeah. right? So this is how you eat. If you, your band has to be smart, if you want to eat. So you play the stuff people want to hear. You play the stuff that, that they respond to, they react to. There you go. And in every band I've ever been in, it was never like, oh, we're a country band or whatever. No, we're a cover band. We are a band. We are a jukebox. We are a five- or four-piece jukebox. And we're going to play everything from Steve Miller to George Jones to George Strait to, to, to the new George Michael. You know, everything. If you want to, if you want to survive, you do that. So yeah, I got a bluebird. And think about it now. This is the mid-'80s. And I mean, and there'd be these living legends, songwriters, but they'd go around four times, everybody playing a ballad. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was just like, you know, on, on some cerebral level, this is amazing, but man, you guys would starve to death as a band. So I really, I made up my mind, like, I don't ever want to play a ballad in, a, in the round. Ever. Yeah. So I just wrote up-tempo stuff. And it served me well because the next thing you know, my buddies back then, Dave Gibson and Russell Smith and these, these famous guys, they would invite me on their round because I was always going to be a tempo thing. And it ended up just, you know, the, the, the so the tempo thing served me well. And so 
I just wrote tempo, man. I mean, you know, and at the time, especially, that was very, very different. Yeah. You know, I was kind of rock influenced. I was, I was that guy who'd listen to everything, um, and so it was really sort of so. That, so I was that, that that that's where I was kind of that new thing, and then I really started hitting, and then and then other writers kind of started imitating that. And the next thing you know, then here come these new kids, and now, yeah, I'm really, really pushing to stay relevant and do that and try to write with these track guys and stuff and and give them room that's been good too because man because it's a i like the humility of that because i know a lot of my peers a lot of these guys they just get my kids don't know what they're doing anymore get, and they just kind of get bitter and it's just like man they, you know the kids are doing the same same thing we were doing 20 years exactly. ago they're just hustling man they're yeah. just they're just there is no there is no it is what it is. There is no right, wrong, good, bad, or anything else. It just, it is what it is. And there you go. Yeah. In in 97, you had a few hits with Tim McGraw. How did you meet him? Man, you know, it was funny. I, I, I loved that. Um, so I was just starting to break as a writer pretty good. And I actually ran into uh, actually ran into his producer, Byron Gallimore, in the parking lot of the old Jamaica. And I, I was walking in, and he was walking out, and he goes, hey, man. Uh, hey man, man, uh, yeah, I mean, Tim really likes some of your stuff, man. Look, look you picture something. He he's really wants some different lyric, and so think about that. As opposed to man, we need an up tempo. We need a, you know we need a song about my, different lyric. That's all he said. He just wants some. He, he said he likes your lyrics. He wants some. He, he wants some different lyrics. And so I went to the publishing company and I was like, so without any regard for ballad, tempo, whatever, polka, speed metal. Just whatever just had quirky lyrics in it. And I put together a cassette of four, of six songs. And then all of them were just weird lyrics. And they were all over the place. Mm-hmm. And Tim cut four of them. Uh, three of those ended up making the record. And then for that same record, he liked it. So me and Mike Reed got together and wrote Everywhere. Yeah, in yeah. there too. So, but yeah, but that, that was it. I really, I always appreciated Byron. Not trying to describe, you know, the kind of, because we all know the pitch sheet is always just like, they try to just try to describe music is like trying to describe colors, sure. you know, and he was just like, quirky lyrics, man. I was like, well, I got quirky lyrics. Okay. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, and I, I got, I got some quirky lyrics. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but, you know, Tim's one of those guys, Tim, I always like to say, you know, cause people think that I'm just like, I don't know, crashing on, you know, the, the, the couches of the Blakes and the Tims and the Kennys. And That's stuff. what I picture. And it's like, and it's like, and it's like, man, I was like, I feel like tell people, people are like, you hang out with Tim? I was like, I hang out with Tim on stages at number one parties. And we're both completely happy with that. I was like, that's kind of, and I do have a personal relationship, more of a personal relationship, but it is just like that. It's yeah. just like, there's some people, you know, and you're really buddies with other people, not so much, and you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, and he's great, and I could call him right now and ask him to do. It. He's done my charity show and stuff. He's great, and we're friends, but we just haven't been that, you know, just that. Well, that's what we do as fans. You know, we picture all these things, and this is how we think it goes. Yeah, yeah. Like for example, uh, Tim McGraw, uh, live like you were dying. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, the there's a key change, a big key change at the end that kind Moderation, of like, yeah. oh, went Scott, oh, totally different. I pictured it where you guys wrote it without the key change and Tim McGraw saying, we need something different here. Is that how it went down, or no, did you write it that way? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> See? Wow, Wrong again. Dude, you're just, you're just in the high weeds, man. Just, God. God. Fa- God. Failures and uh, illusions yeah, and delusions. Yeah. That's and what God, we do. Just like, so, no. You know, okay, so look like you were dying. That thing happened <laughs> so fast. Me and Tim Nichols wrote that. Uh, wrote the second verse at midnight, laying in my jet black living room on the phone at, at midnight, finished the second verse. I demoed it the next day and literally got in the, and, I, and there was no intro. We just had the song itself and I was in the vocal booth with the guitar and I was like, I don't want an intro. I just kind of want to, I started doing that climb thing. And you got to understand when you're in there with musicians, they're all in these different rooms, right? So mm-hmm. everybody has the chart in front of them. So it's not like everybody's just right here, right. you know, sparking off each other. I was like, I just kind of want this thing. I was like, and then, and I was like, and then, then we'll just start the chart, and I'll just start because I start as a downbeat. I said I was in, it just starts right there. And Tony Harrow was playing keys and everything, and so and so they just started doing this climb, and they did it once, and then they did it over again, and that was none of that. And it was like, and we were all like, just looking at each other playing, and got to that, and I said I was in my, and it just happened, and 
And I've never done it before and never done it since, but I was like, this song needs a modulation. Yeah, and that's the key change. That, that, that's that key change. I went, and you'd never nah. done that before? Never done it. It was cheesy. That's cheesy crap yeah. because I came from the <laughs> 70s. And I was just like, you know, just cheesy crap, man. So um, the only moderation I've ever done, I've never done one before or since. Yeah. But it just sort of was like, this song needs and it really is because moderation is for me is it was always just the thing where it's supposed to sort where it's supposed to be. and when they when they did it when it works it's amazing and when if you overdo it it's amazing it's immediately just like come on yeah so, so. well on, on the same song too you know you have the bull named fu manchu and and i mean was that a real bull or how did the I, name man, fu manchu man, we were come? in the middle of the i kind of knew we were in the middle of the course and it was like sky down rocky mountain climbing so it was already pretty you know hallmarky and then we, I kind of knew the you know, love sweeter, spoke deeper. So it was like, this is all saccharine <laughs> yeah. stuff. And I was like, man, we need a little palate cleanser. We need something that kind of makes you smile. That's not, we don't need to go for depth here in the middle. We just need a, we need a random line. We need a little, little thing because we're about to go right back into all these lifelines and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, man, you know, we, we say something crazy about like, you know, like a, you know, like a cowboy rodeo, you know, the, the, those horses they ride. They, I was like, no. I was like, bull. The bulls have got <laughs> yes. the crazy names. I was like, we need a bull. I was like, and we need a crazy name for a bull. And literally, we were just like Fu Manchu or whatever. And the, here's what I didn't realize. So I saw Missy Gallimore, Byron's, who went on to become his wife, production assistant, just demoed the song. Saw her at CMA at, at EMI Hot Dog Day. I was like, hey, I've got a brand new song. She came to my brand new publishing company office, sat down and played it for her. And she got through and she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes you know, you realize that Tim's dad is like, because I know that I knew that Tug was mm -hmm. in not good health. She was like, he's like, like right there. She goes, Did you know that Tim went to the rodeo in Louisiana and rode a bull? And I was like, No. But that's perfect. And I was like, I had no, I had no, no. And yeah, so all yes. these, so all these, you know, just it really was. It was a very meant meant to be. I mean, there's like yeah. we're doing a movie option on that thing right now. Yeah, well, on that, which one? On Live Like You Were Dying. I mean, here we are. What, fifteen, sixteen wow. years later? Yeah, the, I mean, the, and this isn't the first one. I mean, there was a couple that that came and went. There was a TV show. Then there was something that kind of came and went, and something fell, some funding fell apart or whatever. I, I think the, act, the actual whole network went away. Just all that stuff. But all of a sudden. About six months ago, hey man, you know, you know. Yeah. yeah, and this seems pretty credible. This is all this is all done by people you've heard of, by companies you've heard of. It's all it seems to be going on. So sure. it's like, here we are. Sure, uh -huh. like the, I was being told that that uh, Tim's got a, the cowboy in me in the new Yellowstone. Yeah, yes. And, and so, so what's that like for you when something comes out of the the dark again like that? And you're just like, didn't expect that. Yeah, it's it's a really. Uh, it's a it, it's a blast, it's man. Your work just keeps on working for you. It's it's it, it's an honor, man. It's a, I mean, come on, man. It's a freaking it's that's nuts. I mean, it really is. That's that's crazy to actually, you know. Cause every songwriter knows everybody writes songs, but you through all that, you kind of realize that every day, and I'm right. I'm really I'm writing songs, yeah. you know, three hundred plus days a year, and out of all that, like there might be a copyright once every few years if you're blessed lucky i mean there's plenty of people that make lots of money drive sure. nice cars live in nice houses <coughs> that arguably will never write a copyright yeah a real a real you know hang your hat on kind of thing you know there's and, a there's a point we talk to athletes a lot or you know they love the sport they love their job but once it becomes a job and you start doing it for a long time, it becomes tough for some people. Did do you still love music the way you used to? Yes, I love music, and I love I love I love music. People, I love that. That's one of the reasons I got into publishing was just because by the time that happened, you know, I was having a bunch of hits and stuff, and and I went to go write. At, at, I was I started off at A and M at, at at Almo Irving, and I was the young kid. But by the time I left. And they were selling things, seven or eight number ones. You know, uh, I was the elder statesman by then. But but BMG, the old BMG, RCA, bought my catalog. And so I'm over there. And they had a bunch of kids. And so now all of a sudden, instead of me being the 25-year-old yeah. kid, I'm the 35-year-old guy now with a bunch of 25-year-old kids. 
And they were all just, you know, running around. And I'd, I'd ride with all of them. Somebody canceled there. Like, hey, you, get in here with me. I mean, they'd just be terrified standing around the coffee yard. <laughs> just like, you, drop it, give me 20. No, like, write a song now. But, you know, and I, I tell this story, too. I mean, I wrote a song. We wrote a song that Kenny Chesney, I wrote a song with Luke Laird. Who nobody, at the time, seriously, the kid was like 19 at the time. And Kenny immediately put her on hold. And Luke, like three nights later, he calls at midnight, just completely just, you know. <laughs> man, I love you, man. Yeah. I, God, you know, Feeling Kenny, good. Man, it's Kenny. Got to cut that. I was just like, man. I was like, you know what, Luke? I was like, I don't know what Kenny's going to do. I was like, but you know what? You you and I have this song, this song, this very, very short list that Kenny himself put together. I was like, so nobody can take that, man. So mm. so that alone, that's a huge thing to say. There are lots of famous songwriters around this town that would love to be in the position that you're in. So have another damn beer and congratulations. <laughs> and let me go yes, to sir. damn bed. So, yes, so, sir. You know, so... Well, here you are now. You know, you're uh, a co-founder of Big Loud. Uh, it's a record label, a publishing company, a management company, all the above. You're you're on the other side of things. You know, we spent all this time talking about you yeah, getting well, your start, but now you're the man that people are coming to saying, yeah, sir, help me. I want to get into this. It's a little weird, yeah. yeah, what, yeah. What, what's, what's the difference between those three things? You know, when you talk about starting a label, a, publishing, a publisher, and... Uh, management. Well, well, uh, well uh, you know, the thing is, Nashville Publishing, so it really started as a publishing company in 2000. So I left BMG in 2003. That's when I opened the door to Live Like You Were Dying. As a matter of fact, it was on the first oh, wow. demo session that I did. So a way to open a publishing company. But I started that because, <laughs> you know, I, I wanted, once again, to, to be around these young songwriters and that energy and to watch their life change, man. It's just, after my, cause already by then I was getting cynical, like, the heck with a hold. I mean, like I said, there's Luke calling me drunk over a hold. I was already at the point like, well, what do you mean? If I don't have title and lead off single, don't even, what are you doing bothering me? And I just realized like, man, I'm just getting so caught up in all this yeah. shit. And it's like, no, I want to stop. And like, and these kids remind you of how precious every, every one of these little steps are. And I was like, I want to stay around that. I want to be, and that's really, that's why our company, we had, we always start. We have a parking lot party every year. Like, what's your party for? It's just like just for us, just for all of us to get together and have a beer in the parking lot. It's not. It's just a general celebration. I'm the guy at the company, especially. There's a lot of successes happening now. I'm always the guy going. When are we going to have a party? People are like, oh, you just want a party. I was like, I want to stop and celebrate these blessings, and right. we should because I have been there where they were going by so fast. You took and you take it all for granted, and as soon as they even slow down a little bit, you're just like, what the hell is wrong with this? And it's like, dude, that is so screwed up. Yeah. That is so screwed up to not, just in general life, if you can live in a little bit of an awareness of your blessings, how much happier will you be? If you could just live with a little bit more of an awareness of the of your daily and just your big blessings in general. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, it, it's yeah. just so, you just get so, I get it, and it's so, Man, you know, I've done it. I'll do it every day. I'll walk out of here and do it again after talking about it. But, man, just to try to just be, to live in a little awareness of your blessings. When you, you know, sign a writer or, or, you know, someone that's come to town wanting to be a writer, what are you looking for in, in, in these writers? Man, that's just it. So many people, somebody send me a song. And it's just, man, it sounds just like stuff on the radio. I'm just like, yeah, that's, that's okay. Good. <laughs> good, good for you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I want, I want, I would much rather have somebody write stuff that's so like, holy crap, I didn't know you could do that. You know, it, where it really is, where there's some, I mean, it's these people that we work with. I mean, these, you know, they, we got, God, we got Ernest. We got <laughs> yeah. God, just, for, and he was a total rap dude. I mean, he was like serious, spitting fire. And all along, going like, you know, I might try to do a rap thing with him. I was like, going like, I think he's just an amazing songwriter. And he really is. I mean, the guy, the, a wordsmith does not begin to describe Ernest. Uh, and then you get around, you know, you get around Hardys and you get around these guys, you know, FGLs and all these guys sure. and, and Morgan Wallace and all these people that come along. And you're just like, dude, the way these guys want to put stuff together and the stuff they want. And that's, so that's all I want the publishing company to be for, be it for songwriters, be it for artists or whatever is, man, it's not a question of so many writers just like, well, you know, I, I've, I've tamped this down so it'll fit. And it's just like, dude, 
That's, that's what I always I tell so many young writers. Like, man, if they love your song, they will call and ask you to do a tamer line. They will never call and ask you for a better line. That's just a pass. Yeah. They will always call and go, dude, can we not say, you know, can we not say tap dancing stripper on the hood <laughs> of a 69 Pontiac? Like, oh, you want to change the car? with your Cadillac? 69 Cadillac? <laughs> we like, can do that. Yeah, yeah I, man, I, I love that car. More room to tap dance, bigger hood. So, you know, you know. <laughs> do so, you feel the pressure of, of um, you know, steering music and where it's going, country music, or do you let the artist kind of do that? And then, <laughs> like, what's what's what role do you play in that? I want to put out the best stuff ever heard. What, whatever it's And like. half the time, nobody's ever heard anything like that. So whatever that happens to be. And, you know, I mean, the, I, mean I remember our, you know, our, 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 you know, the first FGL album. When it was all said and done, writing all those guys, and everybody thinks they're overnight success. They spent a year and a half writing. I mean, you know, exactly. Cruz was written the office beside mine, <laughs> but there was all kind of rap. The thing is, FGL it got so big and so imitated so fast through all that bro country yeah. stuff that everybody just thinks. But at the time, man, it was like pretty. Trust me, we had some pushback. It was like some what well, because all these songs were about partying and all these songs. But we got we looked at that record and it was like. Okay, fine. Okay, okay. We got a song about Mama then that we're supposed to do for a country record. But what song do we knock out for this lame, predictable thing? I was like, I, 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 I don't want to let any of these go. And it really just came like we can't not put this record out with these songs because it's just who wouldn't want to hear that? Yeah. And it's sort of that's kind of where we're at as opposed to. I mean, we've dealt with enough labels and stuff these stuff where there really is there's a lot of it's driven by a lot of fear and a lot of trying to play it safe and stuff and and you know that that was a lo look a lot and look and i made a lot of friends and i made a lot of money with the old way that business was done in town but 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 it was it was kind of time for a, for a new way i mean i went through the years of of dude like in the 90s and have some new act and there'd be this kind of really standout song on the record like okay there you go I go, oh, that's not going to be the lead-off single. Like, wow, well, we're going to put out this one, you know, to get everybody ready, you know, for that. And it's like, it just, it was just like, you know, man, in music and food, I'm always ready just for something great. I don't have to be, you know, <laughs> you know, it's not like I need to, like, you know, get ready for it or anything. I need to eat this crappy tuna fish sandwich from the truck stop before I go to have some great, like, I'm just ready for greatness at all times. Just bring it all just right yeah. now. Well, I don't need to be softened up. I don't need to get ready. I don't need to be, you know, massaged, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I just, I just bring it, just bring it all right now. Why not? And so that's kind of, we really, at the label, we don't really try to talk about that. It's just, is it a great song? And the question of whether it's going to fit in out there or not, I bet about half the time we're going like, oh, this is, this is going to be hard. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, but that is a great thing. As hard as streaming and download and all that kind of stuff has been on music and songwriters and stuff like that, that has allowed us that thing. We can just put stuff out. That's what we do now as opposed to the old radio, just going to radio and stuff like that. You can stream and stuff and... You get it in front of people, and they, you know, America is the A and R department, and always has been. You know, they'll, right. if they want it, they'll play it, and right. if they don't, okay, you could throw a lot of money at trying to get them, trying to program them if you want to, but just get the music in front of them. Sure, the people you know, will tell you if it's good or the not. The people will tell you, and I'll live and buy it. I'll live and die by that, man. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I want to put some stuff out, and that and for me, as opposed to, well, here's some. Major corporation, you know, mu major music corporation, and we know all the players, and we know, oh, this song will work well because of the demographic they're shooting for and everything. That's easy compared to, is America going to like this or not? And we're really putting it out there. Just, are they going to like this? Like, let's just let's just put it out there and see. You know, and that's really kind of, yeah, yeah, I, I try not to think about it too much or anything, yeah. but it's really because, like I said, we never we never have conversations about that. It's always like people are like at your song meetings and stuff. So it's like I don't even do. So I was like, we don't even do song meetings. I'm like, like well, I don't really because our thing is we kind of are aware of the music. We're get, those are getting passed around anyway, and the only songwriting 
you know, the only meetings that ever gone, like, well, you're cutting that one, right? Well, yeah, of course we're cutting that one. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, it's a great song. Well, <laughs> we're cutting. It's a great song. Like, yeah, and there's no, so there's no, when it comes to that, you know, it's funny. It's, I think a lot, a lot of the places where a lot of people stop and just auger in really hard, we blow past that in about a tenth of a second, that part of it, anyway. How much longer do you think you're going to be doing this? You know, I thought about that, and... I, my, oh, the idea of me not doing it terrifies my yeah. wife. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, she's gonna have you around. What, what are we doing today? 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 So, uh, so um, man, I don't know. This is what I do. I mean, it really is just not a job. I love it. Um, you know, I already kind of take. I get burned out. I kind of take summers off anyway. Take a couple of months off. Go right around on a pontoon boat and drink beer and you know, kind of chill. So. Yeah. I mean, I, no, I, I'm going I'm to, you know, more of the same. I don't know. I, you know it really is not a job. It's, um, you know, I, I can't see trying to keep up with these kids and stuff. You know, these writers, really, man, they're... Well, they've they, got a lot of energy. And and, and they're freaking brilliant. And the thing is, that's what I, I realize now, that all their influences that they got are just so different and everything sure. now, which, which I do love that. I do love that, that people come along you know, with FGLs and all this kind of stuff, Morgans and got all these guys. That, well, what was your favorite stuff? And it's like, well, of course there's a Garth Brooks and a George Strait in there, but then there's just all the hip-hop stuff and all that stuff as well. And they mention all that in one breath. Sure. And it's just like, wow, okay. I mean, it really is. It's just world music now. I mean, it is. And I, well, I, and I always saw it like that, the whole idea of coming here in Nashville on this whole these very distinct genres. Some country music fans won't understand that. Like, every, every ten years, I, like I'm think country music. Country music fans, they're just they're music fans. Let's take exactly. country like they're music fans, and a music fan, if it's good music, they're going to be a fan of it. That's right. How about that? Doesn't matter what the beat is, or yeah, <laughs> what we're talking about. How about like, dude? Trust me, I spent ten years in in country bar in country bars mm -hmm. from Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Louisiana. And when it, where it comes to my band and the stuff on the jukebox, they wanted to hear everything. They wanted to hear all the good music yeah. at all times. So, yeah, yeah. So, Well, Craig, it was a pleasure talking to you. Mike, do you have any questions for... I think what I take away from that is we need to have more parties to celebrate. I things. agree. I mean, you're absolutely right about that. Just in general, in life, you know, we need to celebrate... Our blessings. Yeah, well, just be a Take little bit Take time more, and... Yeah, yeah. And like, like I said, in our, you know, our parking lot party did turn into a thing of... Like cops showed up? Oh, <laughs> oh well, yeah. <laughs> they, they drink all the beer. So, But no, but, but you know, our parking lot party, you know, do it during the day and stuff, but it has to turn anything. We do it every year, and it's just a, it's just a cool, like, for no reason. Cause that even takes the onus off the party of, well, what's it for? It's like, it's just for everything. It's just, it's just a general party because... Just to celebrate in general and just to have a beer with our friends and sit out here and have some popcorn and drink a beer and just, you know, and it really is. It's, it's, it's nice, man. It is. Because like I said, I mean, Lord knows there's so much. Oh, there's a lot of dark and cynical and stuff right now. And everybody's yep. looking for, oh, man, everybody's everybody's miserable about crap and everything. And, you know, I don't know. I, as far as I'm concerned, if you're a young person who's willing to work hard and be positive, you can own this planet right now. Right. I mean, that's what I keep looking at. Everybody's on there yeah. complaining and stuff. And I'm like going, dude, you could grab that ball and head right along the sideline <laughs> to to about 400 to about 400 touchdowns right now because there's a lot of people who are just sitting down and crying and complaining and stuff. And it's like, that's what I like about the music business. It's like, yeah, it's hard. It's impossible. It's all, it's all, it's what I'm, somebody, like, is music business different now than it was? And it's like, it's nothing no. but catch 22s and that's impossible. It always has been. It's never different. But you know what? It, I could go to a number one party of a new kid every week. So this thing that never works, that it's impossible that never works, happens all the time. So, well, there you go. Somewhere in the middle of all that. It'll never happen. Consider that it's happening all the time. So there we go. So. Hey man, thank you so much, really, for Absolutely. talking to us. It was yeah. great. It's yeah. good meeting you, and your 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 energies. You have a lot of energy, and I wow. love it. And, and and you know, being kind of ran through the ringer in this town to see you on this side of it, 
coming out so positive and full oh, of wisdom man. like that, it's very inspiring, Craig. Mm. So I was glad to help you out, man. You know, <laughs> fail, failures, and failures, all that kind of stuff, and then just, my dude, false images dude, that I had dude, of these songwriting. You, you, you're coming to the parking lot party. <laughs> I'll be It'll there. It'll be May. I'll holler at you. You got it. You come over. You get a you get a balloon hat. You get a balloon. Oh, crap. You get a okay. Bu- oh, I, oh, we have balloon arts. You get a balloon animal hat. You get a nice big big cold cup of beer. It's gonna be amazing. I have been to one of your parties. It was after a CMA award. And oh, it was, it upstairs? It was at your office. I was oh. probably in your office, sitting in your oh, desk. Yeah. Oh. But you guys basically turned a workspace into oh, a God, full-fledged those, house God, party. Those night parties were, were biblical. Crazy, oh, man. Wow. <laughs> yeah. so, well, well, put it this way. Taylor Swift came to one of them and was texting about our hangover the next day. We were like, yeah, <laughs> we did it. I mean, our late night parties, man, it was like, oh, wow. Like, All right. Well, wow. we'll do that again, Craig. All right, man. Thank okay. you so much. Craig Wiseman.